on behalf of the Economics Department and the University of Utah, we welcome you to this festriff on Nilifer's lifetime work and memory of the contributions she made through her professional life. I am Peter Phillips. I'm a former chair of the Economics Department, and I have known, <clears throat> excuse me, Nilifer since she was a young graduate student at Stanford University. Um, uh, for the sake of time, uh, I have a, uh, um, a memoriam in Millifer, uh, in, uh, on behalf of Don Harris, who was Millifer's teacher at Yale and then her teacher at Stanford. And I won't read the whole of this, but I will say, uh, read the last paragraph. In retrospect, I think of Nilifer as a deeply engaged humanitarian and activist for a cause that she chose to pursue as a lifetime goal while retaining the intellectual commitment to learning and teaching and the analytical tools of economics. She clearly had a humanitarian understanding of economics as a science dealing with the human condition in society based on exchange relationships. It was easy for her then to relate this to her deep concern for the role of women in society and the barriers which limit their participation as equals in the economy and in society. She lived out her concern as an activist and, a, and for the cause of feminism. May she rest in peace and may her spirit live on through the memory of her life and work and the positive influence she had on those who interacted with her. I first met Nilifer in the late 1970s as a participant in the political economy seminar at Stanford. And I have to confess that her brilliance, her energy, her eloquence, her concern, and her commitment made me feel old even when I was young. And now that I am truly old, I have the tragic pleasure of reading her life from cover to cover. And that really is something about which this virtual conference is engaged, to appreciate her contributions to society, to economics, to feminism, to feminist economics. Uh, and for me personally, um, she was just a really good lifetime friend that I very much miss. And with that, I turn uh, over the mic to Gunsley Barrick, who also has known Nulifer uh, since God was young. Dear friends and colleagues, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, welcome all. I am Gunse Liberic, Professor Emerita in the Department of Economics at the University of Utah. We gather today to remember and celebrate the bright light, the joy of giving, and the dedication that Nilifar carried within her and spread all around so generously. Our sister could also be difficult, stubborn, and a real pain in the neck at times. Yet she was such a force of nature such an un unstoppable dreamer that drew you in time and again to join her and dream big about positive change. In her presence, another world is possible became a high probability worth working for. Nidafar was faculty member in the Department of Economics at the U of U from 1991 to 2021 when she retired. She was born in Ankara in 1955 to a public official family. Her father was a judge. Supported by scholarship, she at attended middle school at the American College for Girls and high school at Robert College, both in Istanbul, then Yale University, where she received her bachelor's degree in economics and political science. She then completed her PhD in economics at Stanford University. She began her academic career at the graduate faculty of the New School for Social Research, then after a brief stint at Ramapo College of New Jersey. In 1991, she joined the economics department at Utah. In Utah, in the early years, she was active in the Middle East Center and women's studies. This was the aftermath of the first Gulf War. She organized teachings and 
energize the U's Middle East Center. Soon after she joined, she developed and taught two economics courses on economic history and economic development of the Middle East and began to transform the existing political economy of women course into feminist economics. I went through a archived course catalog from the early 1990s to trace her impact. In 1995-1996, we renamed this course Feminist Economics and introduced the PhD sequence of political economy of gender in the economics curriculum. Nilfar was my colleague, my co-author, my friend. I met her in January 1985 in New York City when I applied for the class and gender faculty position in the economics department at the new school. Nilfar was an assistant professor and was still working on her dissertation with the Don Harris as her chair. She was on the search committee. I was hired for the position. She was also influential in my appointment as assistant professor in my second academic position at the University of Utah in 1994. She was a fresh assistant professor there. She had argued forcefully, I'm certain, and secured the creation of an economics women's studies joint appointment position. I applied, Nilfar was again on the search committee. I was hired for the position. I remember fondly our years at the new school when we were both starting our careers, full of excitement and carefree. We were travel partners to conferences. Nidifer and I joined in several intellectual pursuits while at the new school. We participated in the gender and development discussion group that met regularly in Lourdes Beneria's Upper West Side apartment in New York City. We were in the group that started publishing the social science journal, New Perspectives on Turkey, in 1987. We were on its editorial board for several years. We co-authored three papers that examined the gendered employment effects of stabilization policies and structural adjustment in Turkey in the early 1980s when the democratic order was suspended by the military coup. As many of you will attest, Nilfar was a lot of fun. She loved to party, dance, cook elaborate meals for friends and colleagues. She lived by the Emma Goldman principle. If I can't dance, I don't want to be part of your revolution. Her warmth, enthusiasm, excitement were infectious. She was also a very giving person. She would reach out at the drop of a hat to a friend in need. I was such a friend in spring 2019 when I had to fly to Turkey for my mother's health emergency in the middle of a teaching semester. She stepped in to teach my course. At first, we thought it would be for a couple of weeks, but it ended up being a month and a half. She had already had a full teaching load. She expected nothing in return and was not compensated. Nilfer had wide-ranging intellectual interest. She wrote on feminist movements internationally and the role of feminism in the nation-building process in the Middle East and in Turkey. She was an early contributor to the feminist debate on international labor standards. Her review of Radical Political Economics article of 1996 was critical of mainstream justifications for poor working conditions in export-oriented sectors of low-income countries. She argued in favor of enforcing international labor standards and union organizing of women workers as the main instrument to counter the deterioration of working conditions. She also had an enduring interest in alternative international trade theories. Most of her impact was, of course, in the development of feminist macroeconomics which is the focus of session one in this conference. Nilfar was passionate about incorporating gender in the analysis of the macroeconomy. I would like to highlight a few of her thoughts. She believed feminist economics could not be confined to questions that are typically raised within the fr framework of microeconomics. For her, not only was the macro-micro distinction artificial, but also subscribing to it left out important feminist questions. 
She believed feminist macroeconomists had to construct macroeconomic models and deploy a broad feminist interdisciplinary perspective. This meant, at the very least, incorporating unpaid labor, without which there could be no labor power or labor force in macro models, and differentiating macro variables by gender, since the behavior of macro variables are shaped by gender norms. Her argument for feminist macroeconomics was not only an intellectual one. She emphasized the value of unpaid work, but also believed that the inequality, the injustice for her of disproportionate unpaid work borne by women was the mother of all gender inequalities. This injustice could only be addressed by macroeconomic models and policy that are attentive to gender variables. Nilufar could have published a lot more. For every publication of record that she has, I contend that there is at least one paper that she never completed. I'm aware of three of those. She had lots of innovative ideas, but her mind worked faster than the pace at which she could put ideas down on paper, um, resulting in many papers on her CV that appear as in progress. It is a tragedy that she left us when she finally felt free of setbacks and was getting ready to live in Istanbul and restart research projects. While our friend is gone, her intellectual contributions will live on through the work she inspired. Here, I would like to underscore her intellectual impact through the activities of, of the International Working Group on Gender, Macroeconomics, and International Economics, GEM, IWG, as the acronym, which is the focus of the second session of this conference. A little bit of history. In 1994, together with Diane Elson and Karen Grohn, Nilefar formed the GEM IWG as an international network of economists for the purpose of promoting research and advocacy on gender equitable approaches to macroeconomics, international economics, and globalization. This team, Karen, Diane, and Nilefar, produced the two special issues of world development that Diane and others in the first session will discuss. In 2003, together with Rania Antonopoulos and Diane Elson, Nilifar launched the Knowledge Networking Progr Program and Capacity Development of GEM IWG. They expanded the objectives of the original group to include teaching and exchange of ideas among participants during an annual two-week intensive course. Several of these intensive courses were organized by GEM, IWG, each followed by a conference at the University of Utah. And research workshops and conferences were held at the Levy Economics Institute. GEM members, the fellows and the instructions and instru instructors in the course, whom Nilufar would mischievously refer to as GEMistas, were mostly economists, recent PhDs who worked in academia, government, international agency, and civil society organizations. Most wore, wear multiple hats, engaging in research, teaching, policy advocacy, policy advice, and formulation, and they are active in international as well as national and regional fora. GEMistas have incorporated the knowledge shared by GEM in these courses i.e. the gender awareness in their research and policy formulation work. Nilifar thrived in the GEM IWG project. She was central to building community in these courses and the conferences. The knowledge networking program has resulted in the formation of numerous regional groups, all part of the global group GEM IWG. So these were in Latin American, Caribbean, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, especially with a particular focus on the periphery of Europe and at the country level in Turkey. And these regional GEMs have organized similar courses with a regional or country focus. GEMistas also formed thematic research groups which embarked upon projects that resulted in publications. While currently GEM IWG is not an active entity, the GEMistas and their progeny, 
the next generation, are continuing knowledge networking through various international and national organizations, perhaps unbeknownst to the next generation, inspired by Nilüfer. To conclude, Nilüfer will live on in our hearts and minds for the extraordinary person she was. Today, speakers from all around the world will portray how she touched our lives more vividly than my remarks could ever paint. I welcome you all in this virtual gathering and thank you very much for joining us. I would also like to acknowledge the efforts of my sister organizers, Rania Antonopoulos, İpek İlk Karacan, Özge İzdeş, Emel Memiş, and our assistant, Utah Economics PhD grad candidate, Yazga Genç, who worked tirelessly and meticulously in putting together the conference. And thank our chair, Tom Maloney, for his support. Before we move to session one, let me provide a brief roadmap of the conference and a few details. We have three sessions. In the first session, we recognize the intellectual contributions of Nilüfer Çatay with the panel on engendering macroeconomics. The second session will be by Gemistas. We will, it will aim to explore Nilüfer's impact on knowledge, networking, and capacity building in feminist economics. And this will be through a panel with members and participants of GEM IWG. Each of these sessions will be followed by a 20 minute discussion plus a 10 minute break. The third session provides a platform for new first friends, students, colleagues, and classmates to share personal or professional experiences and memories that underscore the impact she had on their lives. In this third session, we will first feature the recorded remarks which will take about 40 minutes, followed by in-person remarks and open mic contributions, each of which will be no more than two minutes. We aim to include in the conference recording the remarks by all those who wish to contribute. Thus, session three could go longer than the official end time of 11.45 Mountain Time. We will end when the last person speaks. We will post the conference recording on the University of Utah Department of Economics website. Lastly, a friendly reminder to please keep yourself muted. On that note, I will pass the mic to Ipek. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. It's wonderful to see so many familiar faces, so many um, dear colleagues and friends uh, on the screen. So as Gunsidi has explained, the first session intends to highlight Nilifer's intellectual contributions, uh, which is not an easy task to separate from her contributions to knowledge networking and capacity building, which is the topic of session two. Um, and also her friendship, uh, which will also come up in session three, because she did, Nilüfer did so all of these things simultaneously and in a very organic manner, engaging uh, all these different ways of relating and capacity building and um, exchanging simultaneously. So today we have five distinguished speakers uh, for this first session. We will start with Diane Elson, Emeritus Professor at University of Essex, um, who is a longtime colleague of Nilüfer, and who, as um, Diane will herself explain shortly, along with Nilüfer and Karen Grond, kicked off an initiative to engender macroeconomics back in the early 1990s. And this work continues to flourish as the rest of our speakers uh, will have a chance to comment on. Then we will move on uh, to Özge İzdeş, Associate Professor at Istanbul University, and Emel Memiş, um, Associate Professor at Ankara University, both based in Turkey, who were both PhD students, um, advisees of Nilüfer. Uh, but then in the following years, they became engaged as um, co-workers in research projects and also in, uh, in the GEM IWG workshops. The fourth speaker is Özlem Onaran, Professor of Economics at the University of Greenwich and Co-Director of Center of Political Economy, Governance, Finance and Accountability, 
um, Ozem, as uh, she will explain, has been engaged with uh, Nilifer, has encountered Nilifer initially through the GEM IWG, IWG workshops, and uh, she will talk about her um, Nilifer's impact on her research work. And our final speaker will be Valeria Ekubel, Employment Policies and Gender Specialist, who's also worked with Nilifer uh, over a long period of time as one of the gemistas from the Latin American region. So, um, Diane, do I see you on the screen? Are you here? I, I am you. here, yes. Yes, hi, Diane. Hi. Yes, the floor is yours. Um, so, um, everybody knows their allocated time, and I will remind you one minute left to the uh, end of your time. Diane, please. Thank you. I first met Nilifer in 1992 at a multidisciplinary workshop at the North South Institute in Ottawa, which considered how macroeconomic policy could be recast so that it operated to benefit women rather than operating to their detriment. The workshop was built on research that Nilifer and I and others have done on the gendered impact of structural adjustment policies. And we both contributed a chapter to the pioneering book that came out of that workshop, edited by Isa Bakker, The Strategic Silence, Gender and Economic Policy. Shortly before this workshop, the journal World Development had published a special issue on the impacts of stru structural adjustment on poverty, and the World Bank Economic Review had published a similar issue, modeling the effects of adjustment on developing countries. None of the articles in these two special issues mentioned women. On the margins of this workshop in Ottawa, Nilifer and I, together with Karen Graun, began to dream of a project that would focus on the creation of a specifically feminist economics approach to macroeconomics that would elaborate new approaches and but also make use of quantitative tools such as econometrics and modeling that macroeconomists typically knew, use, but in new ways, taking into account gender inequality and unpaid as well as paid work. The three of us conceived of a process to bring together feminist economists and heterodox macroeconomists to discuss these issues and to prepare papers for subsequent publication. Nilifer was always insistent that feminist economics should be in conversation with heterodox economics, even if some heterodox economists did not think that feminist economics had anything to contribute to macroeconomics. But this insistence of Nilifer's stemmed from her concern that gender inequality should always be understood in conjunction with class inequality. The conversations that Nilifer and Karen and I had eventually led to a project and to the publication of a special issue of World Development in 1995, which the three of us co-edited. Our, our introduction identified four approaches to gender aware, aware macroeconomic modeling. The gender disaggregation method, which disaggregated aggregate labor into male and female the gendered macroeconomic variable method, such as the paper in the special issue by Nulifer and Schüler Oesler, that established that the relationship between long-term development and women's share of the labor force was U-shaped. Their concept of the feminization U has subsequently been widely used, and I think subsequent speakers will refer to it. We also identified the two-sector or two-system method which conceptualizes the economy in terms of a sector compromising the paid, comprising the paid economy as measured by GDP and a sector com comprising the unpaid economy. And finally, there were approaches that combined two or more of these methods, such as the paper by Kirkut Ertuk and Nilufer that appeared in this special issue and that modeled the macroeconomic consequences of secular, cyclical and secular changes in feminization of the labor force and the extension and intensification of women's unpaid reproductive labor. Nilifer 
Karen and I produced a special issue, a second special issue of World Development in 2000 on growth, trade, finance, and gender inequality. Nilifer had researched and taught on international trade early in her career, and she was particularly pleased that in this second special issue, we were able to include feminist analysis of trade liberalization and financial liberalization. Our introduction clarified reference to engendering growth, trade, and finance as meaning making visible the way the structure of gender relations permeates these processes and the institutions through which they take place. Though economic processes and institutions may appear to be gender neutral, they bear and transmit biases that perpetuate gender inequality. Nilifer and I contributed a co-authored article to this second special issue of World Development called The Social Content of Macroeconomic Policies, which identified three interlinked biases. And I'll say a little bit more about these three biases. But first, I want to say that the, the method that we used in this uh, article is not one of econometrics or modeling, although, as you know, Nilifer made tremendous contributions using econometrics and modeling. Rather, it was a method of critical interpretation where we took existing data, existing analysis, and gave it a new critical interpretation, deliberately using perhaps a somewhat provocative language of bias. We saw this as an intervention in policy debates and we wanted to capture attention uh, by using the concept of bias. So we identified three biases, deflationary bias, an emphasis on high interest rate, tight monetary policies and fiscal restraint aimed at maintaining the quote, credibility unquote of governments in liberalized international financial markets. Male breadwinner bias, an assumption that it is the male wage and male welfare benefit entitlements that are and should be the primary sources of cash to support social reproduction with women as dependents and secondary earners. And thirdly, commodification bias, an assumption that public services should be marketized and privatized in the name of efficiency. The combination of these three biases, we argued, operates to the disadvantage of women given the unequal division of unpaid care and domestic work and perpetuates and may even increase gender inequality. I've been reflecting on these three biases in preparation for this talk and thinking about the 23 years since Nilifer and I published this article. I think deflationary bias is now stronger than ever, although in the wake of the 2008 international financial crisis, its, its composition changed somewhat. And we had a period when monetary policy uh, did not um, manifest this deflationary bias, although the deflationary bias of fiscal policy was strengthened. But now we're back to a situation where both monetary policy and fiscal policy reinforce austerity in the majority of countries with particularly negative impacts on low income women. Although there is some focus now on trying to reform the international, uh, the dysfunctional international financial system rather than trying to adjust it. And I'm sure Nilifer would be contributing to that effort were she still with us. Male breadwinner bias has been weakened in many countries with rising female labor force participation and more social transfer payments going directly to women, though women remain disproportionately poor. But there's now a formidable backlash in a growing number of countries to reinstate male privilege and reinforce the responsibility of women for unpaid work. And too often the feminist call for recognition of the economic and social contribution of unpaid work has been met with policies that actually reinforce women's responsibility to make this contribution. Commodification bias has intensified with increasing financialization of services, including care services that may be funded by public money, but are privately produced in ways that enable multinational corporations and hedge funds to extract high returns. 
the failure of commodification of essential services to create greater efficiency is becoming more apparent in more countries. But it will take a huge effort to reclaim these services for the public and design and deliver them in ways that serve the needs of women, especially low income women. I do so miss the opportunity to discuss with Nilufa the current configurations of these gender biases and how we can counteract them. I'm sure she would have made further important and innovative contributions, but she has left us a body of work on which we can draw for further development of our cause. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Right on time also. Um, thank you for this inspiring her story of economic thought and ideas in engendering macroeconomics. And we are grateful to all your efforts um, along with Nilifer and Karen as founding mothers of this area of research uh, where so many of us have uh, followed in. Um, so our next speaker is Özge Izdesh and uh, Özge will um, pick up on that feminization you and the what's um, Diane described as the macro consequences of cyclical, cyclical and secular changes in feminization of the labor force, um, where she worked with Nilifar, particularly in the Turkish context. Yes, Özge. Thank you, uh, Ipek. Um, this is a really great feeling. I'm so happy that uh, University of Utah uh, Economics Department hosted this and uh, um, it is wonderful to see all those friendly faces, hear their voices. So, um, you know, maybe the quote is uh, catching your attention uh, in my title. I will throw a wrench in the works of this system. This is actually uh, an Anatolian protest, protest rock song uh, by Cem Karaca, which Nilfer and I love to sing together, screaming actually. Um, the lyrics gives you the energy, the energy to do this, you know, to throw a wrench in the works of this system. Uh, this is, uh, you know, maybe it is best to start by telling her work was mainly inspired by her revolutionary attitude. And this was uh, so relatively cool. new staff, uh, new staff person. So as that person is onboarded, um, I anticipate that things will. So this was what uh, was so positively shocking uh, and surprising for me to encounter when I started my PhD in uh, economics department to see a feminist, revolutionary and uh, energetic, uh, very politically engaged uh, professor who had to be my mentor. And uh, So uh, Diane already mentioned uh, the world development issues uh, that they actually brought out. And I will mostly focus on uh, her work on gender and crisis. So, um, and uh, I will uh, focus on uh, this cyclicality paper that uh, Nilufer and uh, Porcut Arthur wrote together and published in 95 World Development Issue. And uh, so what Nilfer actually intended to do uh, in this uh, in her work of uh, gendered analysis of crisis and you know the attempt of macro modeling this uh, is uh, it is actually a feminist macro model uh, trial uh, kind of to show how it can be done and uh, so. Uh, what she did new in this paper, let me just say that. Uh, first of all, she wanted to provide an example that gender, gender can be made part of the macroeconomic analysis. And uh, until then, uh, most economists like, did accept already the gendered analysis at the macroeconomic level, especially the analysis of labor markets. But uh, macroeconomics was considered to be about aggregates and considered to be gender neutral. But uh, Nilfar had a political economy vision, and uh, she always had that glasses on when she was looking at issues. So she said that, you know, this is a quote from her paper, 
uh, macroeconomic policies are predicated upon a set of distributive uh, relations across different social groups and they entail distributive choices across the various social groups. So actually it is not gender neutral and uh, this as Günseli uh, very, very uh, rightly uh, pointed in uh, her uh, keynote speech this micro macro this thing you know um, separation is really a synthetic div uh, division in many respects. So uh, uh, they develop a model of growth cycles as a dynamic Keynesian model uh, in lines of Kalechki, Goodwin, and Caldor. And uh, in this uh, work, uh, they did incorporate gender stylized facts that was actually accumulated in the feminist economics literature up to that time. So she also br uh, brings in development and differentiates uh, between plausible outcomes uh, of uh, you know, in countries with different levels of development. And um, in this paper, we see that it is not only how women are impacted by macroeconomic policies that are in place, like structural adjustment policies or macroeconomic, uh, you know, events like economic crisis, how they're impacted, but also how they're impacted, impacts macroeconomy uh, too. So there's a two-way relationship that she is addressing in this paper. In this paper, she is uh, her and Korkutakirk uh, is together. They are uh, bringing in four strands of well-established gendered stylized facts uh, to build up gendered assumptions. First of all, we see that uh, they are uh, bringing in the literature on economic crisis and how women are impacted uh, under economic distress. Uh, to maintain household consumption, we see uh, it was established in the literature that women's both paid and unpaid labor increases. And also another strand of literature in feminist economics uh, was showing us that during structural adjustment programs, which are mostly put into effect due to crisis and under economic contraction, uh, we see uh, similar uh, outcomes like under economic distress, we see that there is a feminization of the labor force, uh, increasing labor demand for women's labor. Um, and uh, so this is mainly due to uh, the employer's willingness to reduce wages uh, in crisis times. And the, therefore, we see that female paid labor tends to increase. At the same time, um, due to reduction in wages and uh, loss of income within the household to sustain consumption, to make up for the loss, we see the unpaid work uh, has been incre increases uh, during crisis times. And this also has to do with the cuts in the public expenditure and uh, the main beneficiaries of those uh, expenditures are primarily women. So that is also another reason why we see a change in unpaid labor of women. Um, in uh, crisis times. The third uh, strand of literature that uh, she brings, uh, she was bringing in this paper was the secular trends uh, that we, uh, in women's uh, labor force participation, the U curve, um, which actually shows us the long run relationship between the feminization uh, of uh, labor force and development. Uh, along uh, the different development levels uh, of countries. What we see is as the country, you know, we see, uh, you know, this is actually uh, first brought up by Bozrap in 1970s. And in early stages of development, uh, when it is mostly agricultural sector dominating in a country, uh, and when the country is moving from that stage to industrialization, at the same time, we see a move from rural to urban, rural to urban where women's labor force participation uh, decreases. And uh, then um, in later stages of development, uh, what we see from, you know, industry sectors, uh, um, actually service sectors, we see an increase in female labor force participation. This can be defined as a secular trend across structural change of development. And finally, 
she brought in the discussions about uh, cyclical changes and how that impact impacted um, uh, gendered employment impacts of cyclical changes uh, three hypothesis framework were uh, mostly used for developed countries until that time and she asked uh, so this question remains to be answered, she says, in the context of industrializing economies going through structural adjustment programs, which of the three hypotheses holds more systematically? And in her paper, uh, she uses uh, moving Özge, from this... Özge, I'm sorry to interrupt. You have one more minute left. Okay, thank you. Moving from those uh, accumulated stylized facts, to plausible guesses of joint impacts, she uh, and Korkut-Kartür develops a model that shows that investment and savings are actually gendered aggregates. And uh, she uh, describes the cyclical patterns based on three hypothesis framework and the secular trends based on the feminization new and structural adjustment new programs and gendered implications literature. And uh, so under economic distress, what we see is uh, feminization of labor is counter cyclical, lower labor costs uh, leads to an increase in investment. And at the same time, in these times, the household unpaid labor increases, which leads to a change in savings. So what defines feminization based recovery according to this study is uh, the change in investment versus the change in savings. And she distinguishes between different levels of development uh, in countries with different levels of uh, development. And uh, this has been, as this is my final slide to conclude, uh, this has been an inspirational paper, an inspirational work on gender uh, macro modeling papers to follow. When we look at uh, the references made to this paper and also the literature, we see that um, you know the review of macro modeling, feminist macro modeling, always refers to this paper as an attempt, as an example to show that actually macroeconomic aggregates has to do with gender, and uh, it impacted also my work because the question, the empirical work to be done, was staying still there. Uh, to see how actually those three hypotheses work in a uh, developing country context. And my dissertation was on Turkey in this regard. And uh, I published uh, three more papers on this uh, topic afterwards. And uh, still uh, many scholars uh, working in the field of three hypothesis framework, yield curve literature and macro modeling literature theoretical and empirical are referring to her work in this regard. And uh, so her claim was that the economy is gender non-neutral and we are, she was saying that we are behind the learning curve and certainly there is still a gap to be closed and uh, we need to uh, promise uh, her to keep up uh, her goal to end gender macroeconomy. Thank you. Thank you, Özge, and thank you for this uh, final inspirational quote from Nilüfer. Um, so our next speaker is Emel Memiş, who will focus in on the um, intellectual contributions of Nilüfer, particularly in the areas of gendered poverty and um, international trade. Emel, thank the you. floor is yours. Thank you, Pekcim. Um, hi to everyone. Uh, my meeting with Nilifer was in um, 2001 uh, when I just joined a PhD program at economics in, in, at Utah. And in the first year of the PhD program, we had not yet taken her courses, actually, feminist economics course, international trade courses. But as she always did, Nilifer brought together all the students from Turkey and invited us to her home. I, I have many memories actually uh, probably share uh, with all of you here, most of you here actually. She would always just wanting to say probably she she would always convey her life energy, you know, to us, to everybody, to her loved ones in such a beautiful way. We, we were forgetting actually our uh, remoteness from home and in a sense loneliness of the city. 
I uh, so those meetings when I think about those meetings, I think it it was also important for us. They had other meanings for uh, especially for um, young students coming from a country like Turkey, young women uh, as graduate students. Uh, she was giving in a sense self confidence to us. In today's academia, when I when I'm thinking how her contributions were at the beginning, uh, today uh, we cannot think about we cannot talk about you know uh, freedom of research, uh, especially in countries like Turkey, uh, and uh, universities focus entirely on performance you know oriented work, uh, what they publish or perish type of mentality together with the anti kind of anti-democratic working conditions. Now I better understand actually uh, how important her uh, being a role model, being a mentor for us. So she was, uh, I would say, visionary in that sense. And I hope that all those contributions are also somehow counted uh, and given their real value. So I just wanted to say with a few sentences how uh, her contributions are going beyond economics field and her ideals actually uh, go beyond the boundaries uh, of the discipline. So um, in all her courses, um, let me start with the, her um, notable examples, like she was giving uh, how knowledge and knowledge which is based on human experiences uh, are important uh, do, in doing science as well. So whatever the economic issue, whatever the subject we were discussing, she was uh, giving uh, very outstanding uh, outstanding examples, like derived from the uh, experiences, different experiences that we are absorbing. She was very familiar with uh, different foundations, the different methodological approaches, and she, she knew very well the theoretical gaps in both mainstream and Marxist economics. Um, she was giving us the problem of assumptions, even very simplistic assumptions. What are the um, what is the what, what is the real matter behind actually at the at the root of the uh, issue? What we should think about when we are talking about or using those assumptions. So one of the example that she was giving was about the concept of free trade uh, and optimum tariff arguments, where she discusses all this at very early years of her career in 1987. Now, I guess you are seeing in the, uh, the citations uh, where they were published, there were two entries in the dictionary. So she discusses there how free trade predictions cannot be realized in uh, the system we live in and uh, especially contributes on the uh, uh, building up her arguments on Joanne Robinson's uh, concept, beggar thy neighbor, the phrase actually that she uses. Um, there, um, uh, we know that the orthodox approach to international trade is assuming full employment. And uh, with that assumption, uh, the most efficient international division of labor can be obtained by uh, free trade and thereby maximize the world output, etc. So Nilifer says, building uh, her arguments on Robinson's uh, beggar thy neighbor uh, discussion, she is adding on to uh, her point, actually. Probably you are aware, you are familiar with her point that uh, because we have worldwide unemployment everywhere in 1930s and uh, now also it's a uh, it, it has a fresh uh, importance. So one, one country can increase uh, employment and total output by using um, different kind of policies like uh, depreciation uh, uh, and uh, what is it called? Uh, wages, lowering wages, etc. So uh, this beggar, beggar thy neighbor policies uh, can be retaliated by other countries which may not uh, how can I say, which may not um, show evidence for free trade predictions. So uh, Nidifar says that if, if we discuss all of these, we should think about international competition, how it's a process that does not take on the place through prices. We cannot just uh, discuss how prices move, but there are significant non-price factors. She had an idea about gender bias, gender inequalities, which limit the role of actually uh, changes in the trade balance and uh, its impact on trade and um, trade gains in sense. 
So following all of these ideas, I realized actually in the three articles that they have written together with Gunseli, uh, they were trying to uh, find evidence uh, to engender trait theories. So bringing all um, wide, uh, how the um, trade implications, trade policies, especially outcomes of liberalization policies around the world can, may extend gender biases. Uh, but also there is another link, she says, it's a conceptually different type of uh, issue, uh, which we already have power relations and in gender inequalities, which in, uh, also have an impact on the trade policy. like. It can change. It can it can affect the trade strategies. Keep some countries, you know, locked in some uh, competitive strategies and so on. So she was uh, even in the. She attended the uh, first ministerial conference, WTO conference, and I could see now that where she is discussing about giving the uh, literature review. She is trying to get it get uh, strength from all the resources that is produced, bringing evidence about how gender inequalities are linked with uh, trade policy and how they should be understood uh, by the policymakers, but also by the WTO uh, responsible, I don't know, representatives and et cetera. Uh, she's, uh, she has an idea about uh, building up a human rights-based approach actually to trade policy. She's, she br brings into the discussion in that paper uh, how the platform of action adopted, you know, by the uh, UN Women World Conference on Women, how that mandates actually all policies, programs incorporate, should incorporate a gender perspective. So uh, WTO has to also understood very, understand very well this mandate, how, what that requires, especially about the link between trade policy and gender biases. So she is raising the significance of the issue and she says uh, the platform also recommends General Assembly to bring together a committee, but they should not discuss gender issues in an isolated way. She has all the points, uh, you know, as early as in that time, she talks about uh, funds, uh, even Tobin tax, you know, to finance gender e uh, equality, including all these international institutions, but also discusses the trade um, related institutions at the international level. Um, in the uh, other two papers that I would like to mention, you will see in the other slide that she discusses, she brings together uh, trade, uh, gender and poverty issues to do the, uh, and tries to engender trade policies uh, while understanding how poverty process works at the background, actually. But she also brings a new uh, perfect, uh, how can I say, she brings together all the alternative perspectives to poverty discussions, also gender and poverty discussions. Um, poverty policies by World Bank at those years, especially, were focusing on um, the assumption that growth directly brings, you know, uh, reduces poverty. Uh, and that was also trade induced. So those, the link there was already being in practice. And Nilifer uh, discusses that, how uh, the assumptions that they are using, how the link that they are setting up is uh, not considering by being blind to gender inequalities, uh, what are the problems of those assumptions and what are the problems of their implications and uh, the results that they are putting in. Uh, she uh, She's um, discussing how um, that cannot be realized in the, in the world with all the different experiences and different structures of the countries that we have. Just uh, finally, uh, I would like to uh, talk about Nilifer's process of just a few sentences. Um, academic knowledge. And ML, actually, we are at the end of time, so if you could okay, please just wrap up. thirty seconds. All Sorry right. About Thank you. She carries actually her legacy of knowledge to future generations, and she's kind of bridging time. Her dissertation was on manufacturing sector in Turkey. She was very interested in Turkey's issues, economic issues. And um, she was discussing inter and intra class distribution of income. And my dissertation, uh, we, uh, which we worked together, was also kind of a follow up 
of her dissertation. She used and uh, she brought up a unionization index in determining the prices and wages. And uh, mine was in a as, as like a follow up. And now I'm working with a student, PhD student, who is uh, working on the same similar issues. I would say, uh, she was so excited when we were talking about our dissertation. And now I'm feeling really how she was feeling. So I'll just want to finish uh, with love and respect to Nidifer and uh, just want to say teşekkürler. Uh, gracias, spesiba. How Nidifer will finish, you know, with all the, all the, all of our meetings, uh, workshops, actually. Thank you, Ipek. Okay, thank you, Emel. It was uh, an ambitious undertaking from the beginning to ask you to do the contributions of Nilfer both on international trade and poverty. And uh, thank you for trying to do that in such a limited time. Um, and I, I think particularly what you said about um, her work on international trade and the WTO um, shows the uh, her Nilfer's interest in global institutions and global policy and how she made the linkages from um, theory and modeling to um, the needs for global coordination and global um, policies. Um, our next speaker is Özlem Onaram. Özlem, are you here? Do I see you? I am. I am here. I'll share my screen and yes. Yes. Now I see you. Yes. Yes. Özlem, the floor is yours. Hopefully, you're able to see the screen yes we can yeah, wonderful thank you very much uh for organizing this meeting uh in memory of nulfer who has left us a great legacy in terms of feminist economics and engendering macroeconomics in particular uh the first time i saw nulfer in person though it's not the first encounter, which was through uh, a whole body of reading. Um, but in any case, the first time I saw her in person was 2002, when she was uh, invited to give uh, a keynote speech on globalization at the Middle East Technical University's International Conference in Ankara. Uh, at that point, she was uh, one of the leading uh, economists for me. Uh, having read uh, the word development, uh, special issues, she had edited together with Diane and Karen on gender adjustment and macroeconomic models uh, and growth, trade, finance and gender. Um, I was uh, very impressed by the questions, very influenced by the questions Nilfer and Gunseli uh, have been asking uh, in their work about the impact of uh, export-led growth um, on uh, women's uh, employment and labor market uh, chances and the work that they had done with Shule Özler uh, also uh, in uh, world development on feminization of the labor force uh, had actually informed my engagement uh, in um, women uh, and labor, uh, which brought me uh, to various uh, workshops and projects that were led by Insan Tunala, who is also here today uh, in this meeting, uh, together with Ragi Asad uh, around the Economic Research Forum for Arab countries, Iran and Turkey. Uh, they, they really made us think uh, hardly about the question about the impact of macroeconomic transformation in the context of structural adjustment programs uh, and ask difficult questions as do they augment employment opportunities uh, for women? Uh, do they really contribute to narrowing down of uh, gender gaps? Uh, I, as a uh, PhD student, uh, or later soon after that, as a fresh postdoc with my colleague Jim Bashlement, uh, have uh, built on this work, cited this work extensively in the two papers we have done for the ERF uh, projects. When I when we finished those papers as uh, fresh working papers prior to publication, uh, I, in the old fashioned way uh, that uh, we used to do in 2004, put them in snail mail and posted them 
uh, to Nilüfer. Uh, the next thing that happened uh, just when Nilüfer received them without any delay was an email where she invited me to come to Utah uh, to the uh, GEM uh, working group workshop, Gendering Macroeconomics. Uh, that was 2004. I was crossing a few too many borders at that moment. I just couldn't make it. Uh, I was, of course, very envious, looked at the reading list. And I'm ever grateful because that reading list formed the backbone of uh, the syllabus, the reading list for the very first gender and development module uh, I uh, had to develop a couple of years after that. Uh, of course, um, I got back uh, to Nilüfer, uh, Günseli uh, and IPEC uh, to ask for also what they do uh, when they teach gender and economics. And they were very generous to share their uh, syllabi with me. So it was a very important uh, turning point uh, for me. Uh, in all these years, I was also working on globalization and labor more broadly. And when I was asked to write a book chapter on globalization and distribution and the macroeconomy, in my literature review, I found this wonderful paper by Nilüfer again, uh, on the themes in Marxian and post-Keynesian theories of international trade, which is also engaging with the new trade theory or a critique of that. Um, so it was such a confident uh, piece and a tribute to pluralism in uh, economics, comparing and contrasting different paradigms and also synthesizing different theories uh, in economics challenging the theory of comparative advantage, discussing the relevance of the theory of absolute comparative advantage, which he always emphasized that it is common to both Marxian and post-Keynesian theory of international trade, uh, and it is unique to them. She did cri criticize the neoclassical trade theory in one of her colorful sentences, very telling and impressive. She writes, specializing in apples or apple computers does not matter in neoclassical trade theory. And of course, what an important insight uh, this is if you also want to criticize Becker's microeconomics of the households. Uh, she had other criticisms to the neoclassical theory about the lack of increasing returns to scale or ignorance about uneven development. Uh, and then she moves on and takes on the new trade theory. Uh, and she does acknowledge that it does integrate many elements of the Marxian and post-Keynesian theories, uh, such as imperfect competition, technological gaps, increasing returns to scale, differentiated products, uneven development, and cumulative causation. But then, uh, then she hits, even though the microeconomics of Krugman's trade theories takes him away from comparative advantage towards absolute advantage, or at least what he calls created advantage or competitive advantage, his macroeconomic assumptions lead him to defend comparative advantage, albeit in a modified version and reject absolute advantage. Uh, of course, she goes into the uh, nitty gritty detail uh, about the new trade theories, assumption of full employment and equilibrating market clearing uh, mechanisms. Uh, and uh, she goes on saying that the idea of free trade is still not abundant in the new trade theory. Um, of course, uh, they do acknowledge other things new classical trade theory leaves out, such as capital flows, but they still insist that the current account is largely independent of capital flows and the current account drives capital account and automatic price adjustments would bring trade into balance. Uh, what a great misunderstanding of the real world economics of many emerging economies, uh, such as the country Turkey that we are coming from. Uh, but what had impressed me in this piece by Nilfer was her confidence and her ability to really uh, distill very complicated competing large bodies of literatures into a 
wonderful uh, literature review that made my understanding of these competing or compatible for that matter theories uh, much simpler. The real turning point for me in terms of my engagement with Nulufer's work, and also I dare to say a very important critical turning point for my own uh, career as an economist, came in 2013, quite a while after I get to know all the work Nilfer has been doing and also uh, online exchanges we have had. And uh, in that, the regional uh, workshops of GEM uh, network was very important. I, thanks to Nilfer and IPEX invitation, went to Krakow to GEM workshop in 2013. Uh, I uh, met not just Nilufar and Ipek, but also Diane, Rania, and Özge, who were there, among others. And what was important in my mind at that moment uh, that I shared with these uh, feminist economists was the fact that the existing body of literature in feminist economics was very much uh, dominated by a microeconomic research strand. Uh, and this is still, in a way, the case. But of course, the gendering macroeconomics projects have uh, led the way to a whole body of uh, new literature now in feminist economics, starting with, of course, the two uh, key edited volumes in world development, which I mentioned uh, before. Uh, in that respect, of course, the uh, work Nilfer uh, had published in the uh, 1995 for development uh, with Corkut Arturk on macroeconomic consequences of cyclical and secular changes in feminization was a very important starting point for me in working towards engendering what I had been doing since my PhD on or around structuralist, post-Keynesian, Kaletskian uh, models. Nilfer really uh, pushed- Özlem, Özlem, final minute. Final minute. Uh, to think, uh, why do macroeconomists need feminist economics and think how we can in integrate the three key issues about uh, labor being a reproduced input and the key economy being a leading key sector, the role of gendered social uh, norms, behavioral differences in determining the demand and supply sides of the economy, and how the gendered and racial profiling of jobs uh, impact bargaining power. That has culminated in basically 10 years of work that has influenced a lot. Uh, my engagement later with the Women's Budget Group in Britain, with Diane or, or Sue Himmelwhite, uh, with the Care Work and the Economy Network, um, with uh, Sergi, who is also here today with us, Elisa, Stephanie, Karen, uh, and others. So this this confidence Nilfer uh, gave me about thinking of demand side constraints that matter in the real world uh, that leads to excess capacity, involuntary unemployment, uh, and non-employment is not a voluntary labor supply choice for leisure by the utility maximizing uh, women or men. Um, and to think about how uh, public spending may make a difference in this macroeconomic context uh, determined by excess capacity and involuntary unemployment, have different types of spending in the care versus other types of infrastructure, more recently on the green infrastructure, may have different effects in terms of both the demand effects through multiplier effects, but also on income distribution between classes uh, and gender employment effects and the supply side consequences in terms of both productivity and labor supply effects uh, made a big difference in how uh, I approached macroeconomic modeling uh, after all these encounters. And of course, uh, coming from a structuralist background, uh, I learned that it's not just uh, structures of the economy around oligopoly power or sectoral composition that matter, but also the gendered structure of the economy matters. So I was a little bit puzzled when I read about Lance Taylor's response to the invitation from Nulifer, Diane and Karen that macro is about aggregate uh, variables 
surely if we can talk about class in macroeconomic modeling, we should also be talking about gender in macroeconomic modeling. I'll end by saying I'll be thankful to Nilifer and she will remain part of all the research we will be doing for what we now are calling uh, citing IPEC here, a purple uh, transition, but also a purple green just transition forever. And Nilifer will live with us in this research forever. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity on uh, reflecting on this legacy. Yes, thank you, Azam. That was a very comprehensive coverage going on, uh, starting from employment and crises and to going on to international trade and ending with macro modeling and a future vision. And I think that will lead very nicely into Valeria's um, presentation, uh, where Valeria has been doing some very inspiring work at the ILO, policy-related research and policy-related work uh, on investing in care and also time use. Yes, Valeria, the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if Oslem uh, emphasized um, Nilo first confidence, I would like to, to emphasize uh, Nilufer's role in opening path for feminist research from the South. I met Nilufer in Utah in the second GEM IWG summer school in 2005, amongst many other cherished mentors and colleagues who would become part of my professional life from then onwards, and many of whom I love to see here to, today. I came to Utah recommended by Rosalba Todaro, who was teaching feminist economics on in an online platform uh, to a Latin American audience at that time, quite pathbreaking. My readings of the feminist economics journal had left me unsatisfied for the lack of Southern perspective. And I was already planning the first Buenos Aires Time Use Survey the field of work of which took place in late 2005. I came to Salt Lake City looking for a grounded Southern perspective, and I certainly got it. Uh, the gem lag emerged, uh, the, the Latin American uh, group emerged from the conference at the end of that summer school. And in 2006, um, uh, we uh, have our first regional summer school in Querétaro, Mexico, and Nilufa was there, uh, as many others, as you can see in that lovely picture. Uh, Nilufa was there guiding, laughing, sharing, and dancing with us. Nilufa's extraordinary capacity to weave networks is the matter of next session. I know. Uh, so what I would like to do in this intervention is to trace Nilofer's influence in the Latin American feminist economic thinking. In 2012, uh, the GEMLAC published a book, uh, which I proudly edited. The book is called Feminist Economics in Latin America, Char Charting sorry, Regional Debates and was the culmination of years of consolidating situating knowledge and policy engagement, and was conceived also as a sort of handbook suitable for teaching purposes in a very GEM IWG, IWG spirit. The book is full of references to Nilofer and her co-author's work and drives much of uh, inspiration, uh, draws much inspiration from them. The first chapter, uh, Alison, in, in, in the first chapter, Alison Baskin tests, tests the hypothesis of the feminization of the labor force that Oscar um, presented before uh, for the Latin American region in the long term, show, showing that um, in Latin America, women's labor force participation is counter cyclical more unstable and more volatile than men's. Uh, and at that time, Alison mentions that the lack of time use data uh, did not allow her to test the influence of the reproductive channel, but that the shorter hours uh, uh, women work are an indication that unpaid care work intensifies without uh, getting redistributed as the labor force feminizes. Soledad Salvador's chapter about gender and trade in Latin America follows in Nilufer's steps to understand gender impact of trade reforms, 
one issue that emerges emerges in her analysis and cuts across all the book's contribution is that it's not possible to identify whether trade liberalization and export promotion policies are uh, in in in in absolute or or in, in in good or bad for women per se, as the impacts are differentiated between women and men working in different economic uh, sectors and positioning uh, or having different positions in the income structure. The class that class matters uh, and intersects with with uh, gender inequalities. Um, so that says that a better question is then how to move to a high road development strategy and orient trade policies to contribute to gender equality, or in our current words, how to make these uh, trade strategies gender responsive. The chapter about the 2008 crisis and its aftermath in the region that Corina Rodriguez Enriquez, Almes Pino and I wrote also follows on the steps of Nilufa and Diane's analytical framework for understanding crisis from a gender perspective, and is an expansion of a chapter published in English in a book edited by Rania and India, who are also here. Lucia Perez Fragoso, a great fan of Nilufa, wrote a chapter on fiscal policies that moves from gender responsive budgeting to question uh, gender biases in tax collection and fiscal policies more broadly, ch challenging and moving forward the debate in the region. In turn, my chapter about the social organization of, of care in Latin America, uh, I, I drew on on on Diane and Nilufer's um, um, social content of macroeconomic policy paper that that Diane described to emphasize that the analysis of the Ampere care work and even the calculations of the value of Ampere care work with regards to GDP were becoming too complacent and even separated from macroeconomic analysis. That is to say, without engaging in how unpaid care work varies with economic crisis or how social policies in their aggregate and distributed impact are also economic policies. Nilofer used the idea of social policies as the ambulance of macroeconomic policies, I recall her saying that in Krakow, and that idea stayed with me as a repeated metaphor over the years to come. Uh, it's more than a decade after the publication of this book, and feminist economics has expanded and thrived in our region. The contributions of the members of Chem Lack during the past decade and of very many uh, colleagues, particularly younger feminist economists, have influenced policy processes, included in the recent Buenos Aires commitment, the outcome of the Regional Conference for Women, where feminist macroeconomic analysis, policy priorities, and even methods were very much inspired in Nilofer's contributions and are clearly spelled out, agreed by countries, and hopefully will help us move this progressive agenda forward. This is particularly challenging in a regional cost context that resembles the 1980s. Uh, uh, in its combination of high uh, levels of debt, high inflation, even stagflation, and a new wave of neo neoliberalism, this time in extreme right guises, that goes against the state and social policies, including feminist social policies that were very much the mark of the early 21st century in the region. Yet we have theorized, learned, grown, weaved alliances and are strong at the shoulders of a feminist movement, movement that is one of the most vital political forces in Latin America. We will have setbacks, but we will get up, stand up, stand up for our rights, get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. That is how I remember Nilufer um, and will remain close to my heart. Thank you. Thank you, Valeria. Um, we have, I love these quotes from Nilifer. Uh, I think this is the second um, uh, event that we're uh, having in her memory. And uh, the first one was at the IAFI conference in Cape Town and the speakers also came up with some of her quotes. So social policies as the ambulance of macroeconomic policies, is that what you said, Valeria? 
I mean, that, that says it all. And um, there was something else that I actually noted down from Özlem's presentation, specializing in apples versus Apple computers doesn't matter in neoclassical trade theory. That's also brilliant. You know, uh, these are quotes to take and uh, use in teaching and uh, in trainings and so on. Thank you so much. So uh, I'm not doing such a good job of timekeeping, I'm afraid. I'm very sorry about this. Um, we have about uh, a little bit more than 10 minutes uh, uh, for discussion, but maybe we will steal a few minutes uh, from the break if we have, if we see more hands. So yes, um, do I see any hands for any comments, questions? And Yazga, please help me if I don't see the hands. Yes, I see some comments on chat from Simel. Thank you, Simel. Um, Alicia. Yes. And then Yazda. Yes, Alicia. <laughs> Thank you, Ipek. Um, well, I'm very glad to, to be here very early in the morning for Mexico, but uh, I think Nilufer, it was a great person and she teaches a lot, especially for the Latin American feminist economies. Most of, of her, uh, her works and also the invitation and the, the, the invitation that, may, uh, that she made to all of us uh, have produced a lot of literature on, on feminist economies. And this is, has been very important, especially because at least we are having uh, uh, opinion in the, in, uh, in the Latin American policies. And this has been a great effort that Nilofer. So Nilofer is not only in her books, it's, uh, she's uh, uh, living and she will continue living in, with all his, uh, his thoughts. And, and really, I'm very glad to be, uh, to be here. And thank you very much for all the organizations, IPEC, uh, Junseli, Rania. And I think we, we must continue, continue the work of Nilofer. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Alicia. Um, Yalda? Uh, hi. Uh, hello to everyone. Really, it was a great session, and uh, uh, I was so much, you know, thrilled by uh, all the work when you speak up. Uh, although I was a part of this process, but, you know, I was uh, listening to what she has done so far and how it, uh, impressed uh, us, affected us, was really very uh, impressive. And I'm, I'm very happy to be here. So um, I have lots of questions when you present it also, but um, maybe I can address one. Um, because Nilfar was so um, protagonist in uh, introducing new areas to challenge and engender macroeconomics always ahead of, its, uh, ahead of her time. And she was always in track with changing dynamics uh, of the global economy. And Bilge is here, and also one of her recent work was with Bilge Artan, and she uh, wrote in 2017 a proposal for a global fund for women through innovating fi finance. So there, uh, she and Bilge discussed the means of financing for gender equality, like SDRs, currency transaction, and you know, uh, currency transaction taxes, Tobin tax, carbon taxes, etc. So, what do you think? You know, maybe. Uh, Özlem or uh, any any any of my colleagues and my friends there can answer. Uh, or what do you think about feminist scholarship to date has developed this area from where she left, especially uh, in broadening the borders of the nexus between climate change and gender equality. And as feminist researchers, what do, what are the next steps? A big question, but. Uh, I would really like to hear your thoughts because she was very innovative at her time. Yes, thank you, Yelda. Yes, it is a big question. Um, before I give the floor to the speakers, do I see any other hands? Yes, not. And uh, and before the speakers, Birge, would you like to comment briefly on your 
relatively recent work with Nilifer on the Global Gender Fund, what Yelda was referring to. I wonder if Bilge is hearing me. I'm not sure. Okay, maybe she's she's she's not hearing us. Um. Okay. So back to our speakers. Uh, Diane. Do you have any comments? Um, uh, in response to Yelda's uh question or overall comments. Yes, I think um Diane. the issue of the intersection. Uh, between uh, gender equality analysis and the climate uh, emergency has now come to the forefront. I know Ursula and EPEC have both been looking at this in terms of the kind of investments that are needed for a just transition. Um, uh, Sergi Floro, who I can see here on the screen, is writing together with Karen Ground uh, a new book on uh, integrating um, uh, uh, the climate emergency questions into the discussion of gender uh, development. So I think there's a strand of work going on there. I think in terms of the international finance uh, issues that Yelda referred to, there's quite a lot of uh, feminist discussion of uh, international taxation and how to reform that and of international finance and how to change that. And then how do you how do you move from those reforms to actually making sure it channels more money into the investment we need, which this idea of a global fund, I think, was, was an idea um, that's worth exploring. Although I think there are other ideas about, say, hypothecated taxes at national level and a reinvigoration of gender responsive budgeting to make it engage with these uh, issues of taxation and these issues of macroeconomic policy in a way that I think slipped somewhat off the agenda. So I think that Nilifer's legacy uh, will definitely be invigorating future our uh, future research. And I do hope there was reference to these unpublished papers. I do hope that there might be some possibility of of of of, of making some of these thoughts available to the public, whether as a, a kind of collected papers edited in some way. I think that would be great if we could also have uh, available to us some of these later thoughts of Nilifer that were not uh, translated into publications. Thank you all. Yes, thank you, Diane. Um, Emel, Özge, Özlem, and Valeria, whoever would like to take I just, Emel, maybe I can add a few things about uh, uh, what Diane already mentioned about the, the need, the requirement to to do more research in the area. There is a, also a huge gap in terms of gender uh, data uh, in climate justice um, discussions. So when you are when you intervene with the international, you know, um, conventions, and uh, if you are doing advocacy work in uh, local like uh, in, in national uh, legal uh, environment, what you need would be uh, research results and also you need data, database, you know, indicators, et cetera. And there's a huge gap on that. It will be great to do, you know, um, to find more evidence. I know it's a very difficult area uh, to go into, but it has different dimensions, especially in terms of the uh, disaster that happened recently in Turkey also after the earthquakes uh, there was a it was realized that there is a huge uh, lagging in terms of research um, coming from the field what are the needs and what we would say by the women's organizations you know as women's organizations what we should say to the states and also to the international uh, audience mm -hmm. thank you emel um Islam? Yeah, happy to come in. Uh, uh, having lost uh, so many colleagues recently, I really uh, am starting to believe in afterlife. It makes me happier. And I'm thinking of Nulufer about the clouds now and biting her lips because uh, she thinks we can't hear her, but we do hear her. And I, Yelda, great question. And I can 
see Nilfer uh, telling us now the next stage, uh, you have gendered macroeconomics, the next is stages to gender ecological macroeconomics, uh, I, I suppose more ecological macro than ecological economics, but probably both. Uh, and of course, Ipek here has done a lot of work in terms of purple and green economy complementarities. Uh, Women's Budget Group uh, has collaborated with the Women's Environmental Network for a stream of papers around a project uh, labeled Feminist Green New Deal. And the idea was very much, um, the idea in Unifar, Diane and Karen were uh, trying to push macroeconomists who didn't engage with uh, gender and gender inequality in modeling before. Uh, that Feminist Green New Deal has managed to bring in uh, people who would be doing ecological macro, ecological finance, uh, critical approaches in monetary economics to really ask questions about macro financial monetary policies or labor market policies, shorter working week, uh, so to support a gender equitable and green transition. And uh, I have come to that point where we really have to avoid uh, thinking of macro policy is you can either do this or that you have to have a choice no we need to have a needs-based policy approach to macroeconomic policy and that things uh that starts with asking questions like how many care workers do we need uh what is a decent wage these people's valuable contribution to the society deserves in terms of wage uh, how much investment do we need in renewable energy or housing or public transport? Once you know the answers to these, then the question becomes, yes, how do we fund it? And uh, I've got to think a lot around uh, taxing wealth back to Diane's also point um, and what that means for inequalities in the intersection of gender, class uh, and race. Uh, but uh, yeah, these are, again, going forward with creating a broad front of compatible economists, compatible theories, models, and bringing them all together for uh, the good cause, which is a uh, purple, green, uh, red transition or just transition. But yes, Nulfar, we are hearing and seeing you. And uh, I, I want to believe that there is life there where we will all meet uh, and have a great party one day. OK, thanks, Oslam. Nice uh, image of Nilifer above the clouds, biting her lips because we can't hear her. Um, okay, so we are at the end of our time. Valeria and Özge kindly agreed to keep uh, to contribute any comments later in the further sessions. So we take a ten minute break uh, and come back at forty two past the hour. So we will start second session just two minutes late. Thank you. <laughs>